very good morning. Uh, today we're talking about Dr. Schaefer's book, True Spirituality, specifically chapter five, The Supernatural Universe. At this point in our studies, we have finished the first subsection of, sec of the section called Basic Considerations of True Spirituality. Chapter five begins a subsection that Dr. Schaefer calls Biblical Unity and True Spirituality. And here, Dr. Schaefer picks up where he left off and wishes to further clarify the unity of the Bible and its practical connection with the, the spirituality of the Christian in time and space. He begins by further elaborating on the reality of the spiritual universe and challenging the notions of naturalism. Against naturalism. His first words are, our generation is overwhelmingly naturalistic. It is important to realize that what Dr. Schaefer means to teach us in this chapter is different from the previous chapters. It is simply this. If the spiritual world and the natural world are linked as he has already established, then when one removes the spiritual perspective, spiritual words no longer have meaning. Let me read that again. It is simply this. If the spiritual world and the natural world are linked, as he has already established, then when one removes the spiritual perspective, spiritual words no longer have meaning. Logic as a whole begins to break down. And this has happened on a global scale. Yet truth is found through living by the agency of the Holy Spirit. Listen to these quotes by Dr. Schaefer. For example, we have said that we are to love God enough to say thank you, even for the difficult things. We must immediately understand as we say this, that this has no meaning whatsoever unless we live in a personal universe in which there is a personal God who objectively exists. Do you realize what he's saying there? We cannot say thank you and actually uh, have to say thank you to God if there isn't a spiritual world. We cannot say thank you and it have any form of meaning unless there is a personal universe and not an impersonal one. He must objectively exist. Otherwise, thank you is meaningless. Dr. Schiffer goes on to say, we also have considered Christ's redemptive death. This has no meaning whatsoever outside the relationship of a supernatural world. The only reason the word, uh, words redemptive death have any meaning is that there is a personal God who exists and more than that has a character. He is not morally neutral. When man sins against the character, which is the law of the universe, he is guilty. And God will judge that man on the basis of true moral guilt in such a setting, the words redemptive death of Christ have meaning, otherwise they cannot. So likewise, Dr. Schaefer wishes the reader to grasp this face-to-face -face relationship with the supernatural world, face-to-face. -face. And this is not unlike the, the view of the reformers who use the phrase quorum deo, which means before the face of God. Schaefer elaborates that this prescription requires a complete view of the supernatural concept. He puts a special emphasis on the role of us and our role as the bride of Christ. Listen to what he says. The Bible insists that we live in reality in a supernatural universe. But if we remove the objective reality of the supernatural universe in any area, this great reality of the Christ, of Christ the bridegroom, bringing forth fruit fruit through us immediately falls to the floor. And all that Christianity is at such a point is a psychological and sociological aid, a mere tool. Dr. Schaefer takes a moment here to contrast this view with that of Aldous Huxley. For the uninitiated, Aldous Huxley was a writer who heavily influenced the 60s drug culture and advocated the use of LSD and other drugs to aid in spiritual experience. Huxley viewed religion as a mere psychological mechanism. Psychological mechanism. 
Schaefer makes a rather significant reply at the end of the chapter addressing the Huxleyan notion. The supernatural uh, reality, the supernatural uh, understanding is not remote. And so we also need to really be uh, clear and need to clarify that Schaefer affirms the spiritual world is not remote or abstract as some like Huxley have proposed, but rather very close. The following verses uh, illustrate this point. Luke 24, 31, and their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Genesis 32, 1 through 2, Jacob uh, went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the, the name of the place uh, Manhenim, meaning two camps. And then this one is rather emphatic. The second Kings passage where uh, Elisha uh, is, is, uh, is praised for his, his friend's eyes to be open. Second Kings, excuse me, Second Kings six fourteen through seventeen, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning, went out. Behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, "Alas, my master, what shall we do?" And he said, "Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them." And Elisha prayed and said, "O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see." So the Lord opened his eyes, and the young man of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now as we begin to deal with this concept, there is an illustration that Dr. Schaefer uses called the illustration of the two chairs. Dr. Schaefer uses this in several places. Uh, he further elaborated really on the concept in his book, Death in the City. But this imagery of the chair was common in the philosophy of Plato, for example, uh, when he contemplated ultimate ideals and realities. However, in a different sense, Schaeffer is, uh, is rather uh, using this poetic manner of, of understanding. He uses the imagery of the two chairs to ask us to examine what ultimate realities we embrace. Okay? So he asks us to be contemplating sitting in one of the two chairs, a thought. It is really like what Socrates says, the unexamined life is not worth living. Which chair do you sit in? Well, when we only need to examine, or we only really need to examine our lives, but also our perceptions of the ultimate realities and what these perceptions mean for, our, uh, for foundational truths for life and time and space. Now, I've used this illustration at different times. Um, and one, one class I did, which was rather fantastic, I, I did a class on true spirituality uh, with the youth at uh, Redeemer Press. And uh, what was rather fantastic about using this illustration in a very visible manner, we actually had the chairs sitting out. And, and so we had a person sitting in one chair, the chair of naturalism, and this person claiming to be a Christian sitting in supernatural. And then sometimes this, the Christian claiming to be a Christian would sometimes ease over into the chair of naturalism. And so they, they would get rather upset. They would get rather angry at the Christian who professed one thing and practiced another. And so it was rather remarkable how responsive they were to that illustration. So this concept of the two chairs he says this, I suggest that this may be illustrated by two chairs. The men who sit in these chairs look at the universe in two different ways. We are, we are all sitting in one or the other of these chairs at every moment of our lives. The first, which we assume is the Christian, sits in his chair and faces this total reality of the universe, the seen part and the normally unseen part, and consistently sees truth against this, this background. The unbeliever, however, is the man who sits in the other chair, intellectually. Uh, he sees only the natural part of the universe and interprets truth against that background. Let us uh, see that these two positions cannot both be true. One is true, one is false. So the question becomes for us really rather personal. What chair are we sitting in? Well. 
If man, if a man sits in one chair, Dr. Schaefer says, and denies the existence of the supernatural portion of the world, we can say he's an unbeliever. What shall we call ourselves when we sit in the other chair, but live as though the supernatural is not there? Should not an attitude be given to the name unfaith? And really, uh, Schaefer goes on to say that those who are living in this way are only really playing at it. It is really that simple. It is not real faith, it is unfaith. And it, it, think about that word, unfaith. It's very close to the word unfaithful. That's what we need to consider. And we also need to understand that it's not to be just purely an intellectual exercise that we're doing here. Uh, it, intellectual aspects are important, but it's not the only aspect. There's been many who have wished to borrow from the Christian faith and the affirmation of certain Christian thoughts and values that are really comfortable for them, and yet not give full credence to others. And these people sit really in the second chair of unfaith. And so here's what Dr. Schaefer says. Christianity is a good philosophy. I think that's, that it's the best philosophy that has ever existed. More than this, it is the only philosophy that is consistent with itself and answers the questions. It is a good philosophy precisely because it deals with the problems and gives us answers to them. Nevertheless, it is not only a good philosophy. The Bible does not speak in abstractions. It does not tell about a religious idea far away. It tells about man as man. It tells about each individual as each man is an individual. And it tells us how to live in the real universe as it is now. Remove this factor and it becomes only a dialectic. So it shouldn't just be for us uh, an intellectual exercise, some good philosophy or dialectic. It needs to be something more. It needs to be something that we realize and we adopt into our thinking. Where our faith is not merely intellectual, it's not merely experiential either. Dr. Schiff says this, we do not need a dark room. This is actually one of my one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Schaefer throughout the entire book. And I, I want you to take this to heart. And I've also blended in a little bit of the language that he uses in the, uh, the audio lectures, which is slightly different. So I've added that into this context of what was uh, versus what was written. So think about uh, this in its whole entirety. He says, we do not need a dark room. We don't, do not need to be under the influence of a hallucinatory drug. We do not need to be listening to a certain kind of music. We do not need to be uncertain. We can, we can know the reality of the supernatural here and now. See, it's not some far off concept. Spirituality is not far away for us. The God of the universe is, exists and he's here with us now. And you remember what I mentioned to you about Randall McCulley, Dr. Schaefer's son-in-law, and Edith asked him to explain. And he reached out his hand and he said to, to Rand, true spirituality is right here. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a, spir a spirituality that is real, that touches time and space, and it permeates time and space, and it holds every atom together, and it's holding us together, and we're reacting with the spiritual aspects of God. And what is the result of this? Well, Dr. Schaefer says this as well. The experiential result, however, is not just a bare supernaturalism without content, without being able to describe and communicate. It is much more. It is a moment-by-moment, -moment, increasing, experiential relationship with Christ and the whole Trinity. The doors are open now, the intellectual doors, but also the doors of reality are open before us. Now, if that doesn't move you, uh, I don't really know what will. Because the God that we believe in is not limited to just when we work up our emotions. In fact, that's, that's an attitude that we should identify immediately as false. We don't have to work up our emotions to experience God. We don't have to work up anything. He's right here. And not only that, he lives in here. And so 
it's, there's an intellectual aspect, it's not a mere dialect. We need a mind-felt spirituality. But you also need a heartfelt spirituality. And we're not mystics. Now, Dr. Schaefer mentions the intellectual doors in that last quote. The intellectual doors. It's no mistake. It is really a vivid reply to the ideas of secular mysticism, and specifically Aldous Huxley. One of Huxley's books, in fact, is titled The Doors of Perception of Heaven and Hell, taken from a quote from William Blake. And the, the quote is, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all these things through narrow chinks of his cavern. So, you know, obviously here he's trying to break forth. He's trying to get out of this cavern that he's closed up in. Dr. Schaefer is saying, look, it's right here. You're seeking in the dark. It's right here. The doors, however, Dr. Schaefer is talking about are not the mystical doors of perception spoken by Huxley, but the true intellectual doors that are, not, that are of a sound mind. They are not elusive to our senses, but a spirituality that impacts our lives tangibly. It impacts our lives tangibly. It is a moment by moment, increasing, experiential relationship to Christ and the whole Trinity. This is, a, is, a, is not a bare supernaturalism, but it has content that could be understood and discerned with a clear and sound mind. And the doors are open, the intellectual doors, and the doors of reality are open before us. So now we can see. We can see with true eyes, not blinded. And it's interesting uh, enough that uh, some of you may, may know about this, that the Huxley's, uh, that, that Huxley's concept of the doors of perception would later uh, inspire the names of the psychedelic uh, rock band, The Doors. Schaefer was mindful of these type of connections and the perils of the 60s drug culture. He even visited Berkeley during the time and not only observed, but also uh, was well versed in much of the music of the day. Biographer Colin uh, Durier documents that he even went to a Jefferson Airplane concert. Uh, here is even Edith's remarks. I want you to hear uh, about this experience that they had. She says, in Berkeley, uh, we not only sat and talked about the problems of the 60s, but after the discussion one night, went to Fillmore West. There we mulled around with the hippies and the druggies. We watched the light show, breathed the heavy air, and sorrowed over the glassy-eyed young people. Our brains whirled, not only from the music, which threatened to, in volume to break our eardrums and the dizzying effect of a light show, but with the lostness of humanity in search of peace where there is no peace. A time of listening is needed, listening to what the next generation is saying, listening to the words of the music they are listening to, listening to the meaning behind the words. If true communication is to continue, there is a language to be learned. As Edith Schaefer. So, as we think about this, uh, there are some rather interesting uh, historical notes that I just thought I would throw out here for just for your consideration. I'm not going to uh, uh, comment on their their uh, emphasis or their significance, but it is rumored that Aldous Huxley was introduced to peyote by occultist Aleister Crowley in October of 1930. Aleister Crowley also influenced such occultists as Anton LaVey, the founder and so-called Church of Satan, and the author of the Satanic Bible. And lastly, one other one that's rather interesting is one has to uh, wonder at the curious providence in the fact that Aldous Huxley and C.S. Lewis both passed away on the same day that J.F. Kennedy was assassinated. So, three figures uh, who perhaps most uniquely uh, define distinct aspects of the culture and climate of the time. In closing, uh, Dr. Schaefer really uh, wants us, is us to, in this, in this chapter, to explain the how, the how to live 
and, and how to exhibit true reality and true spirituality. The how is constantly affirming and constantly consistent with our faith in the crucified risen Christ, living by the aid of the Holy Spirit by faith. And this is not an arbitrary idea, but something connected with the foundation of our faith and existence. Looking back over these things, we will see that it is against naturalism. It is a face-to-face -face relationship that we're going for. A face-to-face -face relationship, much like what the reformers talked about, the Quorum Deo. It is a supernatural reality that is not remote, not far off, but it has uh, an existence right before us. And we need to consider which chair do we sit in? Do we sit in the chair of faith or the chair of unfaith? Is it not that spirit, uh, that, that Christianity is also a good philosophy, but it's not only a philosophy. It is not a bare supernaturalism, but it's not only the supernaturalism. It also embodies real world physical connections and physical realities. The reality that is central. There's not two realities, but the reality of both the physical supernatural world that is not dualistic, but connected. The doors are open now, the intellectual doors, but also the doors of reality are open before us.